Well, hello there. Um, I'm glad that you're you're back online with us, whether you're a member at Harvest Glen or, or a, a somewhat of an online guest. I'm glad that you've decided to tune in. Well, today we're going to be continuing our series that uh, we've entitled Christ and Covenant. And what we're trying to do in this series, which we started last week, was we really want to see the Bible as one story. Though it's 66 books, yes, and though the Holy Spirit used many different human authors, um, ultimately uh, the Bible is one book, and it's about one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Last week we looked at uh, the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We looked at Genesis chapter 1 and 2, about how God uh, is really the subject of the story. He is not only the author by His Holy Spirit, but He's the subject. He's the, the very first thing we hear about. In the beginning, God created. The Bible's about God. Um, more than this, or other than this, we, we also saw that uh, as human beings, we're created in God's image, that God made us special and He gave us... Uh, certain things that he wanted us to do, to exercise dominion, to cultivate uh, and keep what he's given us, to represent him, to steward his creation, all these things. But we're going to see today that things take uh, quite a turn in Genesis chapter 3. It's not long before the story goes um, astray, uh, very wrong. Um, some have summarized the, the storyline, the main storyline of the Bible as creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. That is that God created the universe, mankind fell into sin, God in His grace made a way for sinners to be made right with Him, and then ultimately He is going to come again and make all things new and save His church. These are the things that we believe. Um, we're going to be looking at the second step of that. Yes, God created, but shortly after, mankind fell into sin by disobeying God. We're going to be looking at the fall today in Genesis chapter 3, so I invite you to turn there with me uh, in your Bibles. Now, as we talk about the concept of a fall, this reminds me of a man named David Garrett. Now, David Garrett was a, uh, a prodigy uh, at the violin from a very young age. The age of eight, he was playing with these amazing orchestras and the most magnificent of venues, um, he truly was an amazing violinist. And in 2003, he bought a very rare 236-year-old violin called a Guadagini. I hope I said that right. But he bought this extremely rare, extremely old violin for $1 million. $1 million he paid for this. And unfortunately, four years later, in December 27, 2007, he would, he would lose something. Uh, he would trip and he would fall right after an amazing performance. He would fall down the stairs as he was leaving the stage. And though his violin was in its case, he actually landed on top of it and crushed it. He crushed the neck, the body, the sound box, the sound post. It was all uh, horribly damaged and crushed. Now, restoration efforts were estimated to take up to eight months to restore this violin and cost... Uh, $120,000, but most experts um, agreed that the violin would never be the same. Well, as we talk about our fall into sin this week, what we lost in our sinning against God, uh, we're going to see that we lost our innocence, the innocent state that, the state that we were made in. We, we would lose fellowship in God's presence in His place in the Garden of Eden. We see that the image of God that He created mankind in would be horrifically damaged and scarred and nearly wiped away. And we're going to be asking the question, could we be restored? Would we be restored? Let's look at these things in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to look at the fall. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So we see... Uh, something happens at the beginning of chapter 3. Uh, a new character enters uh, the stage, walks onto the stage. It's the serpent, and it's a serpent that the, the Lord God had made. But what becomes clear in the New Testament, it doesn't say it in Genesis chapter 3, is that this serpent, this one who's going to speak to Eve and tempt her, is no ordinary snake, no ordinary serpent, but it's actually Satan in disguise. Um, several places in the New Testament, Satan is referred to as that ancient serpent, and it's hearkening back 
to this. And what, what Satan does, his first tactic in uh, tempting Eve, is he begins to uh, twist God's word. And he begins to set Eve up for a conversation about God where he's going to be uh, deceiving her. Notice the first thing he says is, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, as, uh, as we know, if we've studied Genesis 1 and 2, God did not say that. In fact, God gave mankind every fruit of the ground and fruit of the tree for him to enjoy. It was only of one fruit that he was not to touch, of one tree that he was not uh, to eat of. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In chapter 2, uh, verse 16 and 17, the Lord had, had said that. Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Satan begins to twist God's word and set Eve up. Look at Eve's response in verse 2. It says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. It is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But look what else she says. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Now that's very interesting. Eve responds to Satan in this first recorded conversation that we have about God, but notice how it's beginning to get off track, and it's getting off track fast. Eve said that God said that you shall not eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now, God didn't say that either. God said you must not eat of the tree, but notice how Eve begins to overstate or over-exaggerate God's command, it make, making him seem almost overly strict. Now, as Eve begins to recount God's command, notice how she's framing it. She began to, to introduce elements to God's command that, that God had never said. It reminds me that there is a difference between understanding a command uh, as driven by love for us and, and having our best interests in mind versus a command given by someone who doesn't have your best interests in mind. It's like a child who maybe begins to doubt that the reason why their parent is telling them not to play in the street is so they don't want, to have any, they don't want them to have any fun. Well, that's not why the parent has told them that. The parent has told their children not to play in the street because they have their best interests in mind. They want them to be safe. But Eve begins to frame it in this way. And maybe God really didn't have uh, their best interests in mind. And, and Satan uh, surely introduces that as well in verse 4. Look with me in 4 and 5. It says, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, Satan's tactics have only intensified. He goes from questioning uh, God and, and twisting God's word, but to flat out calling God a liar, to questioning God's motives. Satan, in effect, is saying, well, no, he lied to you. You're not actually going to die. And the reason why he lied to you is because he doesn't want you to have what he has. He doesn't want your eyes to be opened, Eve. He doesn't want you to know the, the difference between good and evil. Because he knows that if you do, you will be like him. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve are about to disobey God. In verse 6, things are going to, to go awfully wrong. Sin is about to enter the world for the first time, but we should ask ourselves the question, why? Adam and Eve didn't just walk up to the tree and grab it and make a mistake. No, something had to happen first that led them to that point. Here's why. They began to believe things about God that were not true. So don't you ever believe, church, that theology doesn't matter? In fact, I would submit to you that what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. Because whatever we believe about God will shape how we live in the world. It will shape every single decision that we make. So if we begin to twist God's word, or if we begin to question his motives, his love for us, well, does he really have our best interests in mind? If we, if we begin to question his character, it can lead us down a very dark path. Well, he begins to doubt God, his word, his motives, his goodness, his love for them. And she looks to the tree. Look with me in verse 6. So, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a, a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, 
who was with her, and he ate. So Eve looks at the tree, and she notices three things about it. One, that it's, it's physically appealing. It looks like it, it would taste good, that it was, it was beautiful. And number three, that it was, desire, it was to be desired to make one wise. Eve here begins to want something that she does not have. She wanted insight. That's another way of translating this word that's translated as wisdom. She wanted insight. She wanted, she wanted the knowledge of good and evil. Ultimately, she wanted what was not hers to have. And we can sum all of this up by saying that Eve wanted to be like God. Adam and Eve, when they eat, they want to be like God. That was the temptation. Here we see covetousness is at play, wanting what was not theirs to have. But more than this, it's idolatry. You see, mankind, Adam and Eve, and us too, we were created to represent God, not to be God. We were created to live with Him, to submit and obey and live with Him under His reign and rule. Not to, not to serve ourselves, not to be served. The purpose that we were created for begins to become twisted and corrupt before our very eyes in Genesis 3. So what does she do? She took of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. It sounds so simple. If we could just take a moment to think about what happened in that moment. What it cost the direction that creation took from that moment on it should bring us to our knees weeping honestly when we think about it. The evil that we see in creation that sprung from this moment. Eve took an aid and she gave some to Adam who was, notice it says who was with her. He did nothing. He was by her side and he didn't say a word. And he took an aid. Adam is equally guilty if not more. See, the Lord had placed him in the garden first to work it and keep it, to guard it. But they both fail. And they sin against God. And in verse 7 and 8, we begin to see the awful, dreadful first consequences of sin. Look what, look what the man and the woman do in verse 7. It says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You see, Satan's lie had elements of truth in it. It was a half-truth. Their eyes would be opened. Their eyes were opened. They would know the knowledge of good and evil. But they would know it in the sense that they would lose everything good and everything evil would be unleashed upon the world as they sin against God. It says they, they, they begin to know that they're naked. Their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked. Just compare that to the last verse of chapter 2. The last verse in our pre-fallen state, 2.25 says, And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Innocence, bliss. They lose it. They understand that they're naked and they feel shame and guilt. And they sew these fig leaves together and they made themselves one cloth. Notice what in their, in their sin they try to do. They don't run to God, they don't run to Him, but they fear Him and they try to cover themselves. They experience guilt, shame, exposure for the first time. They try to cover their nakedness, cover their shame, cover their guilt on their own. They cover and they hide. They try to hide from the presence of God among the trees. Here's the thing, church. Mankind has been doing the same things ever since our first parents. Some try to cover themselves, to cover our, our guilty consciences by our good works, or some turn to false religion. Well, it's the same mistake that Adam and Eve made, it's self-justification. It's trying to make ourselves right before God by our own means. It's just like the foolishness of Adam and Eve sewing together designer fig leaves. It doesn't work. Any attempt to cover ourselves, to cover our guilt and shame, does not work. 
I think back to the times where I, you know, I've been sharing the gospel with people, with friends, and one of the favorite questions that we like to ask them is, it really gets to the heart of the matter. We, so we, we ask, if you were to die today, and you were to stand before God, and He was to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And so many times, either they don't know, they haven't thought about it, or they are resting on their good works. They say something like, well, I would, I would say that I've been a good person. I, would, I would, would try to convince them of the good things that I've done. It's not enough. Good works, false religion, it's trying to work our way to God. To do enough to be accepted, to do enough to be forgiven, but the thing is we can't. We all fall short of the glory of God in our sin. You know, some don't try to cover themselves, some try to just hide. They pretend the problem doesn't exist. They, they don't think about life's biggest question. Where do we come from? Where are we going? Who made me? Why is the world the way it is? They don't think about these things. And thus don't seek answers. So there they are, our first parents. Distorted by sin, covering in scraps of leaves that they've made. And they're hiding from God. But God in His grace comes looking for them. Look with me. In verse 9, it says, But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now this has all the tones of grace, doesn't it? God didn't have to say a word. He could have just annihilated them. He could have destroyed them and it would have been his holy right. This creature from the dirt defies the living God. And he comes looking for him. Where are you? As if he didn't already know, right? Where are you, Adam? Verse 10, Adam responds. He said, I heard the sound of you walking in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. We start to see uh, not only a gracious God who asks questions, trying to draw them out to, to confess, but what do they do? They deflect. They, they don't take responsibility. God knows, yet he asks, and, and he, he asks the man. But we see the, the effects of the fall right away. What does Adam do? He blames his wife. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. But not only is he blaming Eve, what is he doing? He's blaming God. This is the woman that you gave me. She led me astray. She gave me the fruit. So, the Lord turns to the woman, and he asks her, but the woman takes a similar path. She doesn't blame Adam, and she doesn't blame God, but she deflects, doesn't she? She doesn't take responsibility. She points to the serpent who deceived her. So God has really put them on trial, Adam and Eve, and he's about to hand down his verdict. The time for, for questions is over, and uh, he's going to turn to the guilty parties. Notice he does this in reverse order. He questioned Adam, then Eve. Eve turns to the serpent, and then the Lord God addresses the serpent in verse 14. Look with me. It says, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Notice that no questions are asked of Satan. He asks Adam, and he asks Eve, he doesn't ask Satan. He just hands down curse and judgment. You see, the serpent would be humiliated and ultimately defeated by the seed of the woman. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Then uh, the Lord deals with Eve. Look with me in verse 16. said, To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. 
to Eve, she would experience pain. They were to be fruitful and multiply. That was God's intention, but now that doesn't go off without a hitch. There's going to be pain in childbearing. Pain in life. Not only this, but there's going to be strife in the marriage relationship. And Adam and Eve were formerly naked and unashamed, living in a good world. But now, he tells Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. When he says your desire shall be for your husband, that's not a good thing. Another way of translating that is, your desire shall be against your husband. Saying that Eve will want to overtake Adam, and Adam will want to dominate over Eve, and they won't get along. There will be strife and opposition in the marriage relationship. And uh, it's a testimony to a fallen world we live in now, isn't it? Divorce rampant, spousal abuse, all kinds of things that are effects of the fall. The Lord turns to Adam. He says to Adam in verses 17 through 19, To Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Creation comes under a curse. It's not just Adam and Eve and Satan who experience this. It's all of creation. All of mankind, the effects of the fall are sweeping, cosmic. The whole universe is under a curse. Adam's life and the work that he was meant to do, he would know sweat now, pain, toil, and ultimately death. Death has entered the scene. Let's read out the rest of the chapter. In verse 20 it says, The man called his wife's name Eve because she was mother of all the living. She was to be the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, which is a, an angel, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So God hands down judgment, he explains the consequences for their sin, and what do they lose? They lose the presence of God, and they're cast out of the garden. Here's a quote from one Bible commentator I thought was very good. Explains it well anyway. He said, The serpent held out to the couple the prospect that being like God would bring with it unlimited privileges, unheard of acquisitions and gifts. But rather than experiencing bliss, they experience misery. Rather than sitting on a throne, they are expelled from the garden. The couple not only failed to gain something they do not presently have, the irony is that they lose what they currently possess fellowship with God. They found nothing and lost everything. So why does this matter? It should be obvious why this matters. The fall changed everything. The image of God that we were made in was scarred and disfigured. The three relationships that we were meant to live in, man to God, man to man, and man to creation, they're all affected. Man's relationship with God, he had sinned against him, and thus comes under his judgment. Mankind lost relationship with God. They lost the presence of God, which is what life is all about. If you know Jesus and, and, and you are looking forward to heaven, that's what it's about. It's about getting back to that. Living in God's place under his reign and rule in relationship with him. This is what we're trying to get back. This is what Jesus offers us back by his grace. Not only man to God, but man to man. Only Adam and Eve were there, but what begins to happen? They begin to blame one another. They, they will try to take advantage of one another. Every wicked and evil thing that mankind will do throughout human history comes from this 
one act. It doesn't take long, does it? In Genesis 4, the very next chapter, we hear about Adam and Eve's first sons, Cain and Abel. And we also read about the first murder. Cain murders his brother Abel. It's a fallen world that they now live in. Not only man to God and man to fellow man, but man to creation. The ground was cursed because of Adam. Man would no longer just try to cultivate and keep it and to work it, but we as people would begin to dominate and drain its resources and exploit it and take advantage. It's what we see happening even now. Romans 5.12, Paul says, looking back on this, he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. We are all born with a sinful nature. Psalm 14 says, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, any who seek after God. They all have turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. That's what the Bible says. Psalm 51 verse 5, David, reflecting on his own sin, said, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. The reality is, is all of us were not only born with a sinful nature, we've all sinned against God. We've all fallen short of His glory. We all stand condemned if we do not have a relationship with Jesus, the only way to God. We stand guilty, naked and exposed before God. But there is good news for us. It's the gospel. I'd like to look back to a couple verses that we kind of skipped over or passed over. Look with me at Genesis 3.15, and when the Lord is speaking to the, to the serpent. Notice what God says to, the, to Satan. He says, I will put enmity, that means opposition, between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, what's going on here? What is God promising? What is God telling us and saying to Satan? Well, what we see here is actually the first recorded gospel, if you will, the first good news. God is promising that the woman's offspring would be in opposition to Satan's offspring. But notice how he speaks of this offspring in the singular. He says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Well, who is this talking about? I would submit that this is Jesus, born of a woman, born of a virgin. This one would be the one who would bruise Satan's head. Notice how it says her offspring, between your offspring and her offspring. Usually, uh, when we talk about offspring, the Bible talks about it as his offspring, Abraham's offspring, Isaac's offspring. But notice it says her offspring. See, Jesus would have no earthly father. He would truly be the seed, the offspring of the woman, of the virgin, who would conquer Satan, our enemy. You talk about the Bible as one story, you can see it clearly here. And all the way up to Jesus, we're simply waiting for the coming one who would do this. Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, and through his life, death, and resurrection, he defeated Satan. He bruised his head and he put him to shame. So you may be asking, yeah, I understand that, but how, do, how does that work for me? How does what Jesus did, how does his salvation from sin and death and his conquering over Satan, how does that become mine? What does that mean for me? Well, look with me in verse 21 as well. In 321, it says that the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothe them. Here again we see another hint, another foreshadowing of the gospel. So what exactly did God do for Adam and Eve? This, this first couple who had fallen from grace and sinned against God, before he sends them out of the garden, he covers them in garments of skin. You see, their own attempts to cover their guilt and shame uh, were not adequate. It wasn't enough. These, these fig leaves that they had sewn together, it would not be enough. And it's not enough for us either. In Isaiah 64, 6, he says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. 
See, when we try to cover ourselves before the Lord, it's just filthy rags. It cannot stand. We need to be covered by the Lord in our guilt and our shame. So what had to happen for the Lord to graciously cover Adam and Eve with garments of skin? We notice his garments of skin, it's not designer fig leaves like Adam and Eve had used. In fact, something had to die. The Lord provided a sacrifice. He covered them in their shame and nakedness before sending out of the garden. He provided them a substitute. He killed something for them to cover them in their guilt and shame. This, would, this is really foreshadowing what the Lord would do in the fullness of time when He would come as God in the person of Jesus. He would come and die in our place as the spotless Lamb of God that whosoever repents and believes in Him can be forgiven. They can be covered by His righteousness. So a few uh, words of application as we close. Number one, I want us to see as it's been clearly shown in this passage, I want us to see the seriousness of sin. Adam and Eve fell from grace, and it was such a tragic fall, and it affects every area of our world and our lives today. So let's examine our lives today and confess all known sin to God, and let's remember what it costs God to deal with our sin. You see, unlike David Garrett's violin that we talked about earlier, um, it would take more than eight months of work and $120,000 to fix what we had lost, to fix what had become broken in us. It would take uh, the coming of the Son of God. It would take the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God to deal with our sin, to restore us to what we had been created to be. So let's be people who take sin seriously. Number two, and I'm mainly speaking to Christians here, don't try to cover yourself or hide from God. Instead, let's be people who run to Him. Rest in the covering that He's provided, the righteousness of Christ. You see, we still try to do this. We may try to cover ourselves with our good works to try to clean ourselves up before we go back to God and deal with Him. We may try to, to hide from Him. Maybe, we haven't, maybe you haven't talked to God in a while. Maybe you feel like you can't even open your mouth and speak to Him. If you belong to Jesus, you're covered in His righteousness. So let's run back to our Father. And number three... I want, I want us to all know and remember that God is not done with us or His creation yet. In fact, He's in the process right now of making all things new. So if you belong to Him, know that He has chosen and purpose to work in you and restore the image of God that you were created in. He's going to make us more like Jesus by the work of His Spirit. And know that He is coming again to restore all of creation. And yes, He is coming soon.